So hello everyone and welcome to another conversation of the second cycle of conversations on corporeal architecture. And today I am very honored and glad to have here as guest Luis Othon Villegas, a master from Harvard University, director of LVS Architecture. He has been a lecturer at Harvard University at the New School of Architecture and Design at the School of Visual Arts uh, in New York at UNAM and a professor at ITESM and UAIC. He has worked for Paul Antonelli at Harvard University and MoMA in New York, Enrique Norton Architectos and Rockwell Group and presented his research at the ENFA Symposium in 2020. Awarded with the International Design Awards EDA 2020, Luis Othon has also made written contributions such as the Architects newspaper in New York. He is currently working and collaborating on a new course on NFA with Dr. Michael Arbib, based on Arbib's latest book, When Brain Meets Buildings, also from 2021. So thank you very much, Luis, for having accepted this invitation. No, thanks, thanks to you, Maria. It's an honor to be with you and your, and your students. Um, you know, I love to talk about these topics. So I'm here to, uh, you know, to talk about some of the projects, some of the things I'm doing, but also please uh, do interrupt me if you need to ask me questions or if you have some comments on what I'm talking. So I'm here to learn as well. So thank you very much for having me. Thank you. So should I start with my presentation? Yes, it would be great. Uh, you should be able to share your screen now. Okay, perfect. So please uh, do stop me if you think I'm getting too long in my conversation, or if okay. we, you know, if we're if if we're running out of time, please let me know. Okay. So we um, can I can make it short. Louise, I, I will just say that probably I, I won't interrupt you during your presentation because normally I need a little bit of time to cook up my questions for you. <laughs> so maybe okay. do it like that. Okay, go ahead. Perfect. Okay, so you know the the thing with my practice, and I would like to talk about more what I'm doing is uh, I started studying this. Uh, well, I I study uh, a master's in design study at Harvard because I wanted to learn a little bit more about about history and theory of design. And when I was in studying in Mexico, my school was very focused on construction systems rather than. Uh, something specific about the history or theory of architecture. So, you know, when I was, you know, growing and it was the 90s, we didn't have the internet or the communications that we already have. So I was always looking at these journals and magazines around the world and how they were influencing architecture. And I wanted to do something like that. So I said, well, let's go to Harvard University. Let's see if it's what's going on over there. And I was admitted. So I was very lucky to be there. And as soon as I got there, I realized that, uh, you know, there were a lot of other things that I never took into consideration. So my first approach to the master's in design studies was to focus on theory and architecture, theory and history of architecture. And then when I was over there, I learned that there are more things. So I was in a, in a class from Hashim Sarkis, who's now the Biennale director, Venice Biennale director. And when I was with him, he was my advisor and he was teaching a course that was called uh, Constructing Vision or construct, cons, Constructing Vision, yes. And they were talking about all these uh, effects of the visual system and architecture. And they were talking about perception, and, but always within the frame of the, of the vision. So for me, it was, you know, a mind blowing uh, knowledge and being there allows me to explore a little bit more on the topic of vision, but also on the topic of the general experience of the senses. So I, when I moved to, from, from, from school, when I finished school, I was allowed to work in the United States for one year. And I talked to Paola Antonelli and she was developing a course, uh, sorry, an exhibition that was called uh, Design and the Elastic Mind. And for me, that was mind blowing. I got there and I, I started understanding how you know, design affects a lot the way we uh, connect with the world. So I learned a lot from that particular exposition or exhibition at the MoMA, but then I went to David Rockwell's 
uh, office and they were always uh, exploring this idea of the experience or the design experience. And they were always thinking about not just the visual, but always like trying to avoid or connect all the senses. And that was really interesting because I learned a different perspective of design that was not focusing just on the view, but was focusing on the senses. Particularly for David Rockwell, there was this uh, idea of a spectacle and everything is about a, spe a spectacle. So everything is about, uh, um, you know, plays from Broadway or, or restaurants in Las Vegas or hotels. And it's always about how we explore the emotion within the design. So that was my background. So from that moment, I just started exploring more about the experience of the sensorial experience within the design process. And I was very lucky enough to meet, uh, you know, Michael Arviv, and we've been having a lot of conversations on how we should think about, about architecture and understanding neuroscience. So we must go beyond perception alone, passive experience to active engagement, the action perception cycle. So I was very concerned about how we can, if, if, if it's possible, that architectural elements can influence people to respond to the built environment and what it, does it mean to understand perception in the space. So according to John Evanhart, to call just one author, uh, there are five areas in the brain systems, right? The one that is the sensation and perception, the five senses, learning and memory and how we store information and remember our sensory experiences, decision-making and the execution of actions themselves within the context of the building and how we use, how, how we assess the possible consequences of our actions, emotion and affection, and how do we become fearful, excited, happy, or sad, and movements, how we interact with the environment and navigate through it. And for me, my practice has been focusing on four main points. And this is about, and I think all of us do it, but in a sense, I'm trying to just find a, it's not a formula, but it's something that is a guide for me to, to do some of my work. And one is about observation. The other one is about interpretation. The other one is understanding action and perception. And the final or one of it is a composition. These four approaches that not just are these four, I mean, like there are, it's not limited. It's always thinking about what other possibilities can come from these four concepts. And from that, I developed this kind of a system for my, for my methodologies, I will show you in a while. But I, just before that, I just wanted to let you know that, you know, we always think about the brain and the heart, you know, and how we connect with each other. And I always like to show this image. And this is a house from the early work from Luis Barragan. And this is uh, Casa Clavijero. And this house, for me, it's, this image is very strong, it's very potent because it's powerful because it shows, uh, it gives you the idea of what you can feel there just to looking at the picture. And you can be reading a book just in those steps and you can see how the light is coming and the contrast of the greenery and the contrast of the red door and it gives you a lot of possibilities and affordances to think what's going on over there. Why is the shadow coming like this way and that? And there's a lot of emotions coming from this particular image. So as simple as it is, it always connects our heart to our brain to respond and perceive a space in a different manner and in a manner that goes connected with emotions. So my work, it focuses on four main constructs. And I said, it could be more. This is just not uh, something that is limited. But I'm, with this, I'm trying to find kind of a neuroarchitectural interpretation for the design strategies I develop. So for me, these are the more frequent uh, constructs that I use. One is the semantics. The other one is the formal. The the other one is the dynamics, and finally the cognitive. And from that, from 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 those concepts, I would like to talk a bit about how we do the design work at the office and how we develop our designs. So for me, the semantics is a very important part of the process, and this involves the narrative and language of architecture. 
What meaning means in architecture? Indeed, each aspect of a building can mean different things based both on the user's cultural background and their own experience. So the architects must be aware of positive and negative meanings of the likely users. However, orthogonal to this, we should explore how we might distinguish behavioral meaning, emotional meaning, aesthetic meaning, and the conventional and symbolic meaning within different cultures and traditions. So for me, the semantics goes beyond to culture, ideologies, and conventions, because everything we do is always related to ourselves in the intimate experience, but also related to the cultural and more general experience or where we are designing or for, for who we are designing. The other part is the psychology of color, that this is a very abstract concept because for different latitudes, color can mean different things. And the symbols of architecture and what does it mean by symbols, I will show you, and the narrative or the storytelling. So if I show you these images, the first one on top, you will see a very typical building that has a red cross on it. But what if the red cross wouldn't be there? Like if there's no red cross, what happened to that building? The uses are multiple. We can say that could be a hospital, a hotel, an office building, a government building, but it's just through the symbol of the cross, of the red cross that we already, because of our ideologies and conventions and what we know, we give the meaning to this building. And then we relate a lot of other concepts like health to this particular, or healing to this particular building, medical and everything, all the concepts that goes together with the Red Cross. But in the other picture, we see this magnificent uh, space that we know because we are familiar, because we have a background of uh, what it means to have a space like this, what are these elements and what is the composition of these elements and what is giving us as a language or as a lecture. So somehow we even know how to behave as soon as we enter to this kind of a space. We might be quiet, you know, or we might be just trying to understand what the light is, how the light is coming from, and why this space is, is quiet or has echo. And, and you can see a lot of uh, meaning on this image. However, if we get to this space and whatever is happening there is, uh, is conditioning to our, to our behavior, let's say there is a concert, you won't get there and be quiet and pray. You will go with a concert. You will, maybe you will dance, you know, if there's a music that you can dance. But somehow the space is not conditioning, the users are conditioning to what is happening to the building. However, we have an ideology of how we should behave in this space according to our culture and with our previous experience in a space like this. And the same happened with, with the next, with the semantic of what is giving me these uh, two images. On one side, we can see kind of a colonial uh, atmosphere that is more represented of the Western world, whether on the other picture we'll see an uh, oriental composition of elements that give us uh, a meaning of uh, something that could be a temple. Both here are for religious purposes and the architecture is uh, that we understand or that we experience is because our previous memories or experience within spaces like this, such as this. People that haven't been in, the, in Asia or in any other you know, Asian countries or cultures may not identify exactly what it means, this building that is on the, on the right. But if you are more familiar being in Europe, you will understand that this one on the left could be more related to what we already know because of the styles and the, and the elements that we already recognize. And you know, the one in the, in the left is the main cathedral here in Guadalajara. So that comes to another topic that has to do with memory and how we remember things and how we experience the spaces that we design. For Luis Barragan, which is, you know, I, I, I talk about Luis Barragan because he's from my city and I think it's important to mention how this is also impacting the way we design here in Mexico because we have this him as a reference, as a main reference for ar Mexican architecture. So uh, Luis Barragan in this case, uh, what, sorry, hold on a second, because he's still telling me that I don't have enough 
power. Yeah, I got it. <laughs> my, my battery was going a little bit down, sorry. I, I, just take, so, I just take the chance to say that I'm very happy that you're talking about Luis uh, uh, Barragan. Uh, because he has been a great inspiration also for the, the work with color that I've have been doing around here. And uh, I also want to start more conversations about color. And I think he's the best reference to start with. Yes, yes. Maybe we can have another conversation on that as well. Yes. But, well, uh, in, the, in these pictures, what I wanted to show you is how memory plays an important part of, and the role of architecture and the way we develop or we want to create a narrative for the other. Let's say we got a commission, then we always try to connect or give the experience what we already have to the other one. We transmit it with elements that we have from our past or from our, our lived experiences. So in this case, uh, Ferdinand Bach with, and Les Colombiers in Menton 1925 did this, uh, this in interpretation of the gardens and it's a, it's a kind of a Garden of Eden, and when Ulis Barragón was there, he was so influenced by Ferdinand Bach that when he came back to Mexico, he developed this idea of the picturesque of the elements of the uh, landscape and the elements of architecture, somehow that remind him what he lived in, in Les Colombiers for Ferdinand Bach. So somehow the reinterpretation of Luis Barragán is always about memories. And actually he always talks about uh, architecture is a, is, a, is a stage memory. He always mentioned that, like there is a way of understanding that everything we design as architects, it comes from our previous memory. So, you know, I'm not gonna talk about neuroscience because I'm not a neuroscience, but this is something that is really striking me because, you know, we understand memory and neuroscientists are understanding memory in different ways of, uh, or the interpretations of what memory means. And, and we have, you know, from Michael Arby's books, uh, it's about working memory, episodic memory, procedural memory, and semantic memory. And so how we use all of them, we're designing in a way that we, as architects, we understand how memory works and how we can use these as a strategies, as, there's a tool to bring something relevant to our design when we are you know, doing architecture. So one, one project that I did a while ago, seven years ago actually, it was about a restaurant in a small town close to Guadalajara. And the client asked me to develop a restaurant that will sell Mexican food, very traditional Mexican food. They wanted to give a twist of what was going on in the city and they wanted to make you know, the city very proud of having this restaurant. So when people go to that specific town, people will very, very, you know, proud to show this restaurant and show what they have, the gastronomy over there. So it was important to think about the community and about how we design a restaurant that, you know, is Mexican. We are Mexicans. We understand Mexican food. We don't want to be pretentious, but we want to understand how people can get proud of these space and they can they can tell others to come to eat to this restaurant in this city. So I got the space like this and it was really a terrible space. So when I saw it, it was like, okay, this is a huge, a huge challenge and we need to do something with this space. But also uh, when I was talking about memory, we needed to reproduce a narrative that will connect with the community over there. So as soon as I saw these kind of roofs, I said, well, I really like these roofs. I really don't want to destroy some of the things that are here. We need to talk about tradition and how we can reuse some of this space and resources are scarce. So we need to use better the resources that we already have. So one of the things that I just started to do is uh, you know, trying to connect with what I felt and light was an important part. So this is the same space. So what I was trying to created was a narrative of the space and light. And actually uh, there is a, an author from the town who's one of the most important authors in Mexico, Juan Jose Arriola, and he writes really interesting uh, poetry about the city. So we wanted to bring some of the phrases to the space and write down some of the phrases over there, use the light and show some how this kind of um, emotion or emotive space, so you can read this poem in, uh, on the on the on the city and to connect with the with the space. And one of the things that I started to work with them is a narrative that will show some connection of what people believe, what the ideologies and religious 
and religion, sorry, and how we can bring some of those elements from the street, from the culture to the restaurant. So they use, it, they have this uh, pilgrimage that they had every year and they use all this paper in the, you know, they put it in the street. So we wanted to make an abstract, um, an abstract concept of that paper in the floor. So there is always a connection within color and within the kind of a space that people will remind and connect with the community. Other things that we start is uh, to share value with the community. So we invite people from you know, artisans to work in the restaurant and start using the materials that they use to connect and create some elements like this. This is screen that will divide the space into two from the bar and the restaurant. But somehow we want to bring more people to work with this. With this. So design is not just about what we do as an architect, but who also, who, who, who can in, we involve also with this, uh, with this type of design. So it's not, a, it's not a work done by one person, but it's more thinking about how others can come and do something within the, within the project that will connect better to the community. So the, at the end, we came with a lot of the materials that were developed in this town as well. So these ropes are made in this and a factory very close to the restaurant. So we want to use as well the materials from the town and trying to have a, you know, an imprint of what's going on and the artisans and the crafts that are from the town in particular. So the results are about a color, about the reusing materials from the region and bringing people and community together so people will connect. I'm very happy because this month is, uh, you know, is, uh, is the seventh anniversary of the restaurant. And it's very successful and people feel very proud to go to this restaurant and show the people and show their friends or family or relatives that come to town, visit this restaurant. So it was an important, an important project. The second part I want to talk is about the formal. So we, before we, we talk about the semantics and the narrative, now I want to talk about the formal and what it means to have architectural compositions from concept to construct, the production and materialization of a space apart from the architectural elements we know, whether formal construct or programmatic activities derived from by the, the formulated briefs. And here I'm talking about forms beside function, typologies, frames and scenography and the panoramic landscape. And here is something that is very interesting. I would like to show this image because you, know, you all know the first, uh, the top image, which is the, the Philip Johnson uh, glass house. And just underneath that image or below that image, I, you can see this uh, composition of a, of a square or sorry, of a box a uh, transparent box and a person inside and the other one outside. And there is an essay, which is called the theater of effects from Miss Van der Rohe, where you can see what's, what's inside and what, what is outside. Are you being, or, or are you the observer or you're being observed? And how you feel when you are inside? Do you think you have the control because you are overlooking towards the landscape or you are inside and you are the, the play, you know, you are the one that is uh, bringing all the attention from the people from it, from the outside. And I'm always concerned about this because when we understand this process of being inside or being outside, uh, we tend to understand better how we are designing for the others. Like, and then this, this comes to my mind because I want to tell you about something that happened here in Mexico. And a lot of people are building these skyscrapers or apartments with uh, floor to ceiling windows and showing everything like your house to the outside but people have their curtains down like or blackouts like nobody wants to show their houses and why do we build these houses or these buildings if no one is you know opening the windows and or, or the curtains and this is different from what is happening in Europe where you know you have these uh, curtains or these, these curtain walls and people want to, you know, get as much light from the outside. But in Mexico, you cannot do that. It, you know, it's terrible because we have a latitude that it gives you a lot of light. So you need to shade it down. But why in the first place we're doing these type of things? And we are more um, maybe 
introvert about bodies or the culture, what's going on inside, rather than, you know, in Europe, they're a little bit more open to show whatever is happening inside. So this is something interesting for me. So something that we need to, again, see. And another thing that I always, me, uh, always uh, is very relevant to my practice is to understand and how we frame whatever we're designing, how we create spaces that reproduce other spaces inside the spaces we were designing. This is out of Law's Baker House. And for me, this, this is very interesting because what he created in this house is a way of multi-framing your views as soon as you're moving. So everything is related to the body and how you move inside the space and how you will be encountering different scenarios or different frames as soon as you are moving or navigating through the building. And it's interesting because as, you, as soon as you walk, you see there's a lot of light coming from different angles. But as if you look towards the one side, you can see another frame or another wall that somehow frames another window, and then you see towards the outside. So this is kind of interesting because you, he plays a lot with shadows and light and how you will be moving within the space and will find different frames like pictures that are giving you different meaning towards what you can see at the end of the horizon. So it's never just pointing to one specific uh, view. It's always trying to make you feel like you have a lot of uh, uh, a stimulation from what is coming from the outside. A lot of light, a lot of uh, elements that gives you a meaning or gives you the way of moving inside. So for me, this is another process that I found amazing of the low level vision and the high level vision and how we process light patterns that cover uh, details. And there is a, the, the, the cognitive psychology that says that we are always intrigued by light and shadow. And we want to understand what is happening in a texture or what is happening in an element that, that gives light and shadow, that has a contrast between light and shadow, because we always want to digest how is it working, why is it like that, so we get to very amused of finding what's going on with light and shadow. And this is something from the SALT Institute that you can see is very similar to what uh, Adflos uh, makes in, in the Baker House, that you have these uh, hallway and light and shadow, light and shadow, and somehow it's a mystery of what's going on over there that you might want to move to find out what's happening there. You know, like maybe you want to look towards that balcony or look toward the other side where the light is coming from, but then again, the shadow, then again, the light, then again, the shadow is very interesting. So it kind of makes you move towards the end of the space to figured out what's going on over there. And finally, well, sorry, this is not the final, but this is the third topic I'm talking is the dynamics. Architecture, perception, action, and behavior. We consider the movement a subcase of action behavior because it brings affordances and effectivities into the action perception cycle. Taking effectivities from Michael Erbius' books, uh, I, will, I will explain a little bit more. So one of the things that we talk is about place and orientation, way finding and way losing. Another one is navigation, movements and balance. The other one is kinematics and parallax. And when it, what is important for the, sens for the sensory spectrum is the auditory cues. So when we're designing, we need to focus as well on the dynamics on how we can make people move in our buildings or what they can see in our buildings through movement. This is an example from foreign office architects. This is Alejandro Sairapolo and Farshid Musabi. They designed the ferry terminal in Yokohama in Japan. And this is very interesting because this is a building that makes you move. You're never static. You have to be moving through, through these uh, hallways and ramps and, and it has a purpose. And we understand that they are provoking or stimulating the behavior of moving First, because this is a ferry terminal, you cannot be staying there for long hours, you need to be moving. Okay. So what is interesting is that as soon as you get there, you sense this of uh, moving, you cannot be uh, static. 
And even if you want to take a picture, the picture is never static. Like there's no way that the zoom can stop because the zoom is always, you know, in this, in this, uh, I mean, futility of looking towards a, a specific point, whereas here you cannot find it. Like you are always looking towards the horizon or towards a perspective point, which is very interesting. This comes from some ideas that I, you know, also review on Color Paren and Paul Virilo on the function of the oblique and how they mention movement within the space when uh, the spaces are not uh, perpendicular to the floor or not in degrees angles, but always in a shape that makes you feel like in a dynamic composition that you're moving through a spaces. Uh, something that always uh, interests me is about the parallax composition and how you can be in the space and keep walking and the elements moves around you. Or it looks like because of the composition of different elements in front of you, you can be moving and then you see everything else moving around. So this is uh, something interesting that I always want to explore. Like as soon as you move within the space, how this, the other elements are moving that are not moving, of course, but that you feel that they're moving with you. This, uh, this is something that was explored by uh, Robert Schinkel in the Altes Museum in Berlin. When you see on top of the, of the museum, you see these columns uh, looking towards Berlin. And he always tried to show that as soon as you come in from the staircase, you see the elements that are blocking the view, but as soon as you move, these other elements start moving and then you appreciate better what's going on outside and the city and Berlin. So that's how, when, you know, when you turn around, you start looking towards the horizon because you're intrigued with what's there outside the columns that are blocking your view. Somehow it provokes that you see what's outside rather than just focus your attention to the, towards the inside. And in that sense, uh, there was a house that I, we designed uh, a year and a half, two years ago in Tapalpa, which is a small town here close to Guadalajara. And we have this site that was very stiff, stiff uh, the slope was very stiff. The diagonal was almost from the, from the top of the, of the side, we were in zero meters, and then we have 13 meters uh, on, the, on the lowest area. So it was a kind of a very uh, stiff, the, the, the diagonal of the, of the site. So we had, you know, the restrictions of the, the sun, the, the, how the sun is important for our project. And we needed to use as much land or the flat land that we could use. So we need to focus the house in the longest uh, composition so we can use better the site and not just, you know, uh, making the house like flying or something like that. Mm -hmm. But we had really wonderful views. So we needed to check what were, this, this was best view, you know, the, the, the one that was the arrow in purple was our best view. So I started to design these as, as you know, as a big box, uh, just, just to say, and trying to use the whole area that could be flat or that we could, could flat better. And then another, another square that, you know, will give me the programmatic idea. But then this idea of the views was important. So how can I create a space that can be seen or the valley that we can see uh, underneath, how can I see it from the street? So somehow the house need to, needed to be, you know, going with the with the with the site with this slope of the of the site. So what I started creating is to you know make a, a fragment of the box and try to separate the elements as much as I can. So in order to create different views from different angles and this idea of the parallax, of course, this idea of when you're moving, you can see different elements that will connect through the space, but this has wonderful views of the forest. This was an amazing site and we needed to respect as much as of the trees that we could. So I tried to use the area that we didn't have enough uh, trees. And this tree over here was one of the most important on the site. They wanted to keep it like the main 
you know, the, the, the king of the trees of the site. So, so we, we started with this composition of fragmenting, trying to follow the idea of Le Corbusier and the continuous ramp that will go through the uh, space and will allow you to go through uh, one space to the other within the same uh, building. This is the Carpenter Center. I don't know if you remember this. This is in Harvard University. This building is very interesting because it has a bridge that connects one, one street to the other through this uh, bridge, uh, the, 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 the building um, is penetrated by this bridge that goes from one street to the other, which is very interesting because somehow you're, when you're walking, you feel with all these trees here and the trees that are just passing the first volume, you feel you never, like you are in a forest, yet you, you never enter the building. You go from one space to the other, open space, and then you, you feel the, the, the trees on top of you. And as soon as you realize you are, you know, your, 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 your ceiling is concrete, but then is again the tree. Or you started from the tree, then you see the concrete, and then you will see the tree again. So this is something that always I, intrigued me and I really wanted to do something similar. So the house was separated in three volumes and connected by this bridge ramp that somehow will give this idea that you are, when, as soon as you're connecting from one space to the other, you feel that you are in the forest or that you're crossing through the forest of these spaces. And this is uh, the final uh, composition, what it happened. So the house is somehow uh, developed within different platforms. We needed to develop a platform, a main platform over here that, uh, you know, this is the highest, uh, part of the, of the mountain, this is the lowest. So somehow we started the house with one volume here, but then we created another space underneath following the shape of the, of the, of the mountain. Like underneath these rooms, there's nothing, it's just soil. So, because we needed to go like in a, in a stair, mm -hmm. in a staircase composition. So these are the, the compositions I wanted to, to do because when we're walking, we can see different elements through uh, the spaces that we're moving. So as soon as I, you know, this is kind of a find where you can, you know, find the door. So there's no like a typical door. This is of course the garage, but if you need to go inside the house, you need to walk towards this area and then you find the door that you can enter through this bridge. And then you can go down and then go through the other bridge and then you can go down and walk through these other you know uh, hallways that are always open so you go this way and then you enter here and then you go down you can walk like this and then you can go to the other side of the house to the to the to the, the bedrooms and so uh, light is also very important i didn't want to have uh, in the in the ceilings that are with wood, I didn't want to have any hanging uh, lamps. So everything is with indirect uh, lighting. So everything is very subtle. So we don't have a lot of light on the space because the space is filled with the natural light, the sunlight. And we're very lucky that in this area of Mexico, we don't have uh, you know very dark night. So it's a... Uh, it's a very nice area. So at the end, this is, this is the result. One of the things that was very important is that we wanted to use regional materials. Everything is regional. So the brick is from the same area. Like we didn't move that much the brick, the brick is from there, but the brick we needed to paint it in black or in a very, very strong gray, very dark gray. So we didn't, you know, we didn't contrast that much with the forest because the house is really big. So if we, if imagine if this brick was the real color, you know, the, the, the terracotta or the kind of orange color, we didn't want to have it there. So we wanted to have the house, like a shaded house with, that will mix with the forest. And we needed to open other senses, like the sense of a smell. So I opened this patio and put a, tangerine tree so we wanted or nectarine I think it's nectarine tree in English mm -hmm. it's like an orange you know the, the, the nectarine right it's, yes, it's a nectarine yes. yeah yeah so we want this this house we call it 
la mandarina, which is nectarine. So what we wanted to have is somehow a smell when you enter to the house and you are in the studio, we have nectarine trees there. So the smell or the idea of the smell is still there, you know? So this, uh, this is why we painted this uh, wonderful color, this orange that will be a contrast. And then you can have some area for meditation or for, you know, yoga in the area of the tree. So, and finally, uh, the cognitive is about uh, reading atmospheres, the architecture of cognition and emotion, sensory experience, stimulation and suggestion, reflection and contemplation, script, affordances and scenarios. And I, you might remember these from Bob Condi as well, uh, the idea of affordances and how we, when we are developing architecture, we always kind of giving the guidance or the script of what's going on there. But I think that's also kind of a scary and dangerous. When we see this, uh, this image of this playground, we see a castle and maybe the kids that goes there will play like the king, the queen, the princess. So there's kind of a, a script that is written for them. And as soon as they get there, they will play that. That's, that's their game. However, I think that is not giving enough creativity to the child to develop their own you know, uh, stories or whatever they want it to be. So I believe like we need to explore more architecture and allow them to create their own stories. So I'd rather prefer to have a playground like this one that is giving me more possibilities and it's not giving me a script or a guidance of what should I be or what I need to be within the story. And here I can be whatever I want. So if I want to be an astronaut, I can be an astronaut. I can be a hiker. I can be, you know, whatever I please. And this allows me to be more creative. And I believe that happened, if, even if, if this is happening in a playground, we can do it in, in architecture. And that's why I really love these examples from Michael Smith's book as well that one is uh, uh, the museum of Lina Bovardi, where the affordances or the possibilities are infinite of how you can explore art in a different interpretation of what you used to know of how you think it should be portrayed or the art should be portrayed. In this case, Lina Bovardi plays with glasses and show the paintings in a different way. You can see what's be behind the, the frame something that you're not allowed normally in the building of in a museum. And here you can see other, or, or you are learn, or you learn other ways to see art that has, is not just restrictive to how it should be done. And the other picture that I really enjoy is the Guggenheim Museum. For me, this is amazing how it changed the paradigm of a, of a museum, of how, the art should be portrayed. Even though Victoria Newhouse makes a critique on this because they say, well, you know, this is a continuous ram that you're always looking towards the art in a tilted way. I mean, for me, it doesn't make sense, but it is very interesting. So you are in a continuous flow that you may not remember where you were of the, if you were in a gallery, but as soon as you go to the void, as soon as you see towards the inside of the building, you locate yourself. You don't feel lost. And I feel sometimes a little bit more or lost in a, in a normal museum or in a regular museum that you get there and you never know if you already went to that uh, hall or you need to go back to see what you're missing. Mm -hmm. And here is very interesting because you are in continuous flow looking towards the art, which for me is another interpretation of a, uh, affordances or the scripts or the way you create effectivities. Mm -hmm. Finally, we did this project based on narratives as well and, and thinking how we can give affordances or cues to the people to uh, create better spaces. And this is a supermarket. And the idea was these images shows uh, something that we enjoy when we go to the outside and, you know, to the street market and we, remember the smells or the colors and this is wonderful i really love that however in some latin american cities like in monterrey where this project is 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 built it is very problematic there's the city that 
it's an industrial city that didn't have a lot of influence from the past of the colonial because it's a modern city, a new city that follows very much the example of the sprawl city of the United States. So somehow this uh, city is non-pedestrian friendly at all. Mm -hmm. uh, you cannot move in this city if you don't have a car and this is terrible. Mm -hmm. So people live like that and they don't realize how important it is to move and walk. And even though the, the weather is really bad, it's very close to Texas. So you can imagine how uh, that atmosphere, it feels very much like a, like, you know, like a very sprawled city of Texas. Mm -hmm. So it's very similar. Monterrey is like, that. it's like that. So this is the supermarket as we, as we enter and we saw the supermarket and we said, well, this is a problem. This is an HEV. It's a very huge change, supermarket change in Mexico that is from Texas, actually. And they came to the city and put this supermarket and they said, well, Luis, we need to do something with this market. Even though this is a very well-known, it's very famous and has wonderful you know, sales, they needed to do something more uh, generous to the people or that change the experience of the people there. So we start working on how this is a lot of contamination, pollution of the information that we need to digest if we want to create a space that could be a little bit better or that you will find better or you will locate yourself better within the space. So we start working with some strategies on analyzing the space and figured out how we can create spaces that will be more harmonious, but also that will give a clear lecture of what's going on there and not having a lot of information. So we found that there was a very complex system of uh, or lack of visual regularity. There were damaged floors, out of a scale space because they were very, very high. And you know, lighting was really bad and there were no accentuation or displays in the gondolas. So we needed to regulate first all the perimeter, like a ribbon that will go around the supermarket to put order, to harmonize the whole space and to make it a little bit clear what was going on there. Because before they used to have like different heights, different things, uh, advertisement and letters and you know, elements, like a lot of pollution, a lot of contamination, visual pollution. So what we did is to create a ribbon that will go all around the supermarket in order to create more visual cues to what's going on in the space. So for each area, we determine one color. So for instance, what we remember as the nature of vegetables, we created the green color. So we, the ribbon that on that area is green. And then we have some different elements for scale to create a much sense of human scale rather than having this huge scale. But we needed to create something that somehow will connect to a better atmosphere. Mm -hmm. And we had this, for instance, it was really, really bad. Uh, you know, all this visual contamination, all this regulation, all this text and the lighting, it was not working. So we created a space that again will yes. create a ribbon that will organize and will put everything together and in order. And also the flooring that was important to create these small cafes within the supermarket. So we start creating different atmospheres for each of the uses of the space rather than having just the typical big supermarket. So we created these small spaces that you can you know, get there and Take a take a few minutes and enjoy coffee, and then go back to the to the supermarket like we used to do when we go to the street. You know, when yes. we were in the street, that you can stop there. If they don't have it in the city, at least they would have it in a you know in a closed space in a warehouse. At least they have different atmospheres so they can enjoy. Otherwise, they won't have it outside. Yes. So, this is the uh, some of the results. Luis. Sorry to interrupt yeah. you, we just have to pay a little bit of attention to the time and I feel really sorry to interrupt you because this presentation this is, is the so last interesting. <laughs> this is the last one, don't worry. Okay. I finish right. here. So the aim is to find a feasible system of interpretation of NFA for the special perception action, user experience, environment and architectural production. 
We'll use the new architectural interpretation system using the design process to find better architectural responses for the spaces we, invite, we inhabit. Never from a perspective of functional behavioral conditioning system for the design of a building, but to better understand humans' sensory spectrum within the built environment. For instance, people's mental health and physical well-being, emotions and better living conditions within the various behaviors and aesthetic experience that architecture can offer. Thank you very much for listening to me. <laughs> Thank you so much, Louise. Uh, can you please stop sharing your screen? Because now, now yes. I'm, I'm really looking forward to start with, with our uh, conversation uh, part and thank you so much for this really wonderful and inspiring uh, presentation I think this was so uh, valuable uh, to me personal but obviously to our students because I think it was one of the first conversations we had in the whole range that could really show some practical applications of how we can use this knowledge from from neuroscience for architecture to do actual design projects and projects and to see uh, how they can actually work. So it was also very interesting that you showed these before and after pictures, and we can see in a very tangible way the difference that it makes to uh, learn uh, from this new knowledge, to think about it, reflect it, and to apply it um, in practice. So thank you so much for this uh, very, very valuable and thoughtful uh, contribution. Uh, also, one thank of you. the aspects I found very interesting uh, in your presentation and in your work is that you're also picking up references, for example, from Louis, Louis Barragan uh, to understand what already from the history and, and, and from also from the culture of, of uh, architecture and also the context where you, you are working in Mexico, how it's possible to weave these things together. Because there's also, of course, in the tradition of building a lot of knowledge that was not influenced by neuroscience directly, uh, but that we can actually also use neuroscience to understand why they work so well. So I, I find it interesting that you are uh, bringing these, these two things uh, together. Also, you mentioned the psychology of color. Uh, I found it also particularly interesting that in the first example you showed of the, of the restaurant, this project you did for the restaurant, that you had this image with a reference from the rituals of the culture. So for example, these paper uh, things mm -hmm. that people do for the processions and the parades and how how to pick up the colors and also the geometry and bring it into the context of the design project so people can connect to the semantic level of the project. Exactly, exactly. So maybe could you talk a little bit more about this, how you got the idea? Well, you know, one of the things that is very important where you're, when you're designing is how you connect with the final user, you know, not just with the client, which is important, of course, because they're paying, but also to tell them that we need to create narratives and stories that will connect with the emotions of the people as well. And if I want to create something that will connect with them, we need to involve all of them. And that's why we talk to the artists and that's why we talk to the artisan and how we can bring together the community and share the value of what we're doing. And this is something I've been learning, you know, within within the projects is not something that I'm doing by myself. You know, there are two people here that are part of my team and we are always working with these type of ideas, you know, how we can connect better with whatever we have in hand within the context. And I believe as soon as you involve uh, the community or the users, they will connect better. So religion is important and we have a a narrative that connects with people that somehow is unconscious. And that's why the colors are unconscious because even the restaurant is called the Guzman, which means from the town, you know, from this town, uh, uh, like uh, Guzman is a, is, a, is a city. So we said the Guzman, like we are from here. So mm -hmm. actually we had a hashtag that was proudly from here, you know, the, which is important for that particular restaurant. But I have other projects that we are exploring always. What are the architectural elements from this town, from this space, from this culture that might be relevant to bring to these projects so people will connect in a sensory level, not just telling them, oh, you know, this is exactly how you see it, but somehow it's there. It's 
as soon as we understand that, you know, architecture is like fragmented memory. So we might understand that we don't bring, I needed, I, I didn't need it to bring the paper there. I'm putting the paper there. So how is a more, uh, not just ephemeral way of putting something that we remember or something that we know, but to put it in the floor is, uh, is something that was gonna last but it's, all, it's something that is going to be easy to maintain. And it's something that will remind you somehow, like it gives you a cue or a, a hint of, uh, of the culture. So this is kind of always trying to find or connect where am I designing or for who I am designing and what is important for them as architectural elements or as architecturals from the context, from the ideology, from the conventions that I can bring to this particular project. But not all the projects work like that, you know? Mm -hmm. it's, it's, you have to figure out what is it that is going to connect with the people. Yes. And their emotions. But I think this is really important because of, uh, sometimes also in these discussions of neuroscience for architecture, um, sometimes uh, we think about, okay, but the ethical dimensions and how far are we manipulating people and consciously and so on, because we, we know, for example, that marketing is a very sophisticated science in manipulating people. Um, but mm -hmm. it's also interesting to understand that their uh, marketing works because in on a, it knows how to reach people also on a very deep level, because yeah. there are needs that people have and that very often we might overcompensate and, of course, uh, uh, be a little bit uh, somehow also exploited uh, sometimes because of, of very effective marketing strategies. Have you seen? <laughs> exactly. Have you seen? But, but if we understand how they work and also if we, if we see it also from the perspective of the users, uh, I mean, the user always knows that they only play as long as much as they want. So uh, there is a lot of things that we can understand also from marketing and from neuromarketing that we can actually use in architecture to create yeah. spaces that can really resonate with these deeper needs of people, mm -hmm. of, of mm -hmm. communities. So I think I, th I find it very interesting that we can see that we can also open our perspective as architects and as interior designers to sometimes be a, a little bit less uh, fearful of, of working with this kind of knowledge because we can, use it, we can use it in ways that can uh, help people uh, live in a more, even in a more fulfilled way. And we know that branding uh, works so well in, in so many cases exactly because with the logos and all these things, it really picks up on, on these ideas on identity, on mythology, on symbols. And um, I find it very interesting also that you, you refer also to religion and to conventions um, because uh, we know that perhaps nowadays in the 21st century, in some cultures, religious, religion might not be such, such a big part anymore. Uh, but in any case, even if, if uh, some people might have been educated within a specific value system. And even if they, for example, don't go to church anymore or things like that, those things are part of them on a very, very deep uh, yeah, level. Yeah. Uh, so exactly. to, to give one, one example, for example, with this red wall, <laughs> red wall I have, and many people ask me about the red wall. I, I grew up in Portugal, which is a Catholic country, and I grew up in a Catholic family. And although I don't really go to church anymore, uh, like every week. And so I deeply appreciate what I have learned uh, about architecture in such religious spaces. And I actually visit uh, churches very, very often. And I, I still very much admire the, the ritual and the aesthetic and all these things. So yeah. I think it's very important that you also showed uh, projects that show how we can bring some of these dimensions from ritual and deeper meaning also to, to a restaurant or to something we could say a bit more profane, uh, mm -hmm. but, but that also has this kind of, can create this kind of sacredness of the, of the everyday, of the things that we do. And, 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 and I will tell you, this was very important because that particular town is a very religious town. Mm -hmm. So somehow is, there's, a, there's a reason why we bring it, you know, because we know that every year they do this uh, procession with the images because it is important for them 
uh, to bring or to take out of the church these images because every year they remind uh, that they are you know taking care of the town because it's a seismic town and they feel that if they don't take these images to the procession is going to be a, an earthquake again. Mm -hmm. So some, somehow this connects with the feelings of uh, everyone involved. And for me, I, I believe that architecture should connect with you in different levels that really you know, vibrates with, uh, with the emotions, with you, with how you connect. In, and if we want to make people to enjoy this place, they will need to find it familiar. They will need to find something that they will feel comfortable that they will feel they belong to otherwise i cannot bring an architecture that is going to be an example of european architecture within a town that is not going to connect it's not going to be successful but as soon as i bring you know their own elements of the design their own elements that they recognize then we will connect then we'll be successful then we'll feel familiar then we'll be in the friends so everyone will be together because we are creating architecture for them, not for us, not for recognition, not for the ego. It's for us, it's for them, you know? Yes. And it's, it's for something that they need to, to connect. So each project must be different according to whoever we're designing. And you mentioned something about how manipulation can be done with marketing. And of course, we, I, I believe that architecture can do something as well. I mean, we can do, we can, direct we can stimulate behavior in a certain way but at the end the user is the one that decides what is the final use of the building because we might be thinking that we want to create something but it, it might not work that way i always think that you know we are in that particular of a exploration of how we can create spaces that can do something you know, within people behavior, but at the end, we don't know if it's gonna work or not. Like that happened in, in, in the supermarket. You know, we were very lucky that it worked. You know, it worked that people could stay longer hours. It worked that they love it. It worked that it reminds them, you know, a, a different space that they want to stay rather than, you know, because they don't have this reference outside. Mm -hmm. So for them, it's much better to have this reference inside than you know going out and going jumping back to the car and driving again 30 minutes to their houses in you know in these uh, highways yeah. which is really bad so i really prefer to go to supermarket spend a little bit of the day and having fun with my kids or my friends and meeting them in a space that is for you know for 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 a gathering and for meeting people and the social aspect is important and this brings another atmosphere to people's lives you know to to their own energy <laughs> yes yes of course because uh there, there's also i i find this example we get with the supermarket also really interesting because we can also see the before and after pictures and um you actually worked with a kind of even minimalist uh, strategy because you just mm -hmm. use color very effectively you lowered the ceiling and you really created these spaces and you even mentioned specifically to humanize the space so before mm -hmm. we could see just like imagine uh, bodies floating in space there yeah it outside. was garbage all over the place like full of garbage and i needed to clean it i, I feel you know i, I feel like Marie Kondo <laughs> <laughs> entering and putting everything in order okay i'm gone yes but it really was a great job absolutely because besides uh, creating uh, different spaces with mood also just this gesture of lowering the ceiling and making it more inviting for people not to just, you know, go through these places and seeing all this spam to actually use going to the supermarket also as an opportunity to stop and take a look at things and be curious what's new, uh, maybe smell something, maybe, oh, I can sit here and also have a coffee and spend some time and maybe there's internet, I will even hang out here for a while. Mm -hmm. It's really different. And and then the whole experience of, of shopping and doing these things that we have to do just to support the everyday uh it's not just one of the, oh, one of these horrible things that i still have to do yeah. to get through the day uh, it, it becomes something that can become also just uh 
another good way to spend some time or a worthwhile way to spend. Some you know, what I was the happiest is when they told me that in the in the area of the restaurant, they increased their sales by 30, 300 percent. Mm -hmm. uh, so that means it was good. You know, like a lot of people wanted to stay longer hours. I mean, this is something that for the capitalism is a, is a success, maybe for other areas. A lot of people would say, wow, you did something that, you know, will stay, I don't know, for, this is a different... for business purposes, you know? Yes, but, but, but we, we, can, we can also think about it. Uh, here, I, bring, I, I always think about my references from performance arts, that the situation is they, they had this idea that started in the 50s, uh, and they were already, of course, criticizing capitalism. How can you hijack a system and use the mechanisms of this system in a way that can make it on another purpose? So perhaps we can, in this way, hijack this uh, capitalist system with all its problems, and at least to to also see how how we can use it depending on the context to bring. Yeah, and it's a positive the experience. You know? for all. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah and it's a positive experience i mean like if people go there it's because they want to meet with someone else so what happened is that they increase the amount of people coming to the place and stay longer hours and meeting with people and this is always crowded like the restaurant is always crowded and you know you see kids you see families you see old people which is great i mean somehow it's a social gathering experience Yes, I mean, uh, I, I can also relate to this to this uh, aspect of, of course, I have some uh, paradoxical feelings about it because I grew up in in a suburb from Lisboa, which which was a kind of a very hard communist suburb where people didn't really hang out outside at all. And when I wasn't even living there anymore, I was already uh, studying and working in Lisboa. They built like a huge mall in there, which was the only thing that happened there ever and and it, it's really from the outside a really really ugly thing um but it became the place where actually the whole the whole city started to exist as a city because the inside spaces are really well done and it has a lot of natural light and suddenly that place that was sad and with a lot of vandalism okay some interesting indie post industrial culture, it started to change and it started to develop. And many people who lived there stopped using this place just to sleep because they were also working there. And what's interesting now is that 20 years later, the actual city started to change because of this. So what wow. used to be an ugly suburb started to become also something else. And there was a small historical uh, part, which was, a little bit damaged with a, with a big earthquake in the 19th century and so on. And now this is also picking up and renovating. So it's really interesting yeah. to see how uh, sometimes over time, something like this can, can have a ripple effect that we can't predict immediately. But if we are clever, we can see uh, how things can, can transform. So not only, this, not only um, because we talked about capitalism and this kind of uh, sales orientation and so but I think that we we need to be open to see all the all the effects all the ripple effects that this can have and also yeah. observe it in time how it can continue uh, but also something very interesting that I found in your presentation was that um, you also mentioned that uh, in some contexts and in some projects it's uh, you find it also interesting to challenge the conventions so you you showed also this example with the with the park for the children, uh, which is I also hate these scripted parks, which are more like booby traps where children get hurt, and then the the other one much more free where children can actually make make their own play and also uh, the experience of the of the flexible museum that you can kind of make your own script through through the museum. Uh, so, how do you have an example of a, of a project where you were on purpose thinking about creating a space where conventions could be challenged? Well, you know, in, in houses, for instance, uh, for instance, the, what I, I'm, I'm always trying to find out how we can challenge the way we live and 
of course, there are a lot of there are a lot of references from other architects, no, and how others are doing. And I believe the the system in Mexico for building houses is is a very typical typology. And the typology goes, uh, you know, like you enter to space and actually that typology, I don't have the example and that could be another topic, but I, to, to, to make it short, the typology of the house in Mexico, the typical uh, house is uh, from, from this, uh, from the last, you know, half of the century from the seventies until now, it is kind of a reproduction of the social housing, but in a, big, in a bigger uh, area. So for me, it's interesting that you have always a garage and then you have the kitchen and then you have a dining and living and the staircase and on top you have a, you know, a TV room and the four rooms around. So somehow that is a typical uh, typology that is happening. And I'm always trying to get rid of that. So for me, the challenge is always to tell my clients how we can change that typology to a typology that won't remember or that won't be anything like those typologies that we constantly repeat. And for me, the, the successful projects are those that are changing that typology. And I'm saying because the clients that pay architecture in Mexico are clients that are, can pay, uh, you know, a house for, that can cost, I don't know, for, or maybe for, for Europe or for United States could be cheap, but in Mexico to hire an architect or have your own design is an achievement. It's not something that you can do everywhere. Like I think everywhere else, right? Yes. But, <laughs> but here I've been very lucky to have these clients that want to explore other typologies, other ways of uh, living a house that is not the typical house of a, uh, that goes around the kitchen or the dining or the, or the TV area, which is what we inherit from the past, I think everywhere. So for me, this is something that I'm always trying to, uh, to explore, like how we can change, if, uh, if I'm commissioned with a house, how we can change that to a different exploration that allows people to see and live the house in a different way that is not just the, you know, what we inherit. That's one thing. I have another project that I, I didn't show. And this was about experience uh, space that it used that used to be uh, a kind of an over the counter. Like there is this kind of a, well, I, I will tell you really quick. Let me just put my mind in order. So this is a, there's a company in Mexico that sells nutritional products. And this company sells the products just over the counter. So you have to go there. It's not a, not a sales service. It's not like a supermarket. You had to go there and you, know, you have to present yourself in front of a person that will give you through the counter the product. You cannot take the product with you. They will give it to you. So somehow this is uh, something that this client asked me to change that. How we can change now to have a self-service uh, design or self-service uh, store that we can create a market for this. So we developed that project over a year and I was doing a lot of research on how people used to buy in that, uh, in that uh, store and we changed and challenged the user and the, the, the company and the client itself so we created a different typologies. So again, this is always an exploration with a client that I'm very, I'm very lucky enough that they trust in my work and we work together to develop these type of projects. And you know, next time I will show you that project because that's a very long project. And we work a lot with the senses. We even design the smell of the space. Oh, wow. So we we were working with people that will design the smell of the space. And we work with the light consult with the lighting consultant. We work a lot of the senses in order to create a space that uh, would be interesting and challenging for the company and for the users. Actually, we created a prototype that is right now running and it's been running for eight months and we are still studying it. So, but the prototype is being built, the one-on-one and it's being tested. 
because uh, the company says, okay, if we're going to do this, we need to test it because this goes uh, for a product that is going to be around the world. Mm -hmm. So somehow it's still confidential, but this is something that is very interesting because we explore like a different typologies, different way of moving, and we explore all the senses with this uh, project. But that's great that we can talk in another in another uh, conversation. <laughs> well, maybe yeah. next semester, or maybe next semester, I'll give you another ring. <laughs> uh, yeah. I know that uh, Milton has to leave, but he would like to share something with us. So please go oh, ahead. Yeah, yeah, please. Please, Milton. So, so um, this has to do with how people interact with architecture. And it took place in Guadalajara about 20, 25 years ago. I don't remember how long it's been since I was there. But when I came into town, there had been an explosion of population increase during that time. And the city was, was completely uh, uh, swollen with new people trying to find a place to live and to work. I saw an enormous amount of graffiti. Yeah. People just painting on, on everything, everything that they could. And I took that to be a way of coping with not having turf not having place just to take possession of the architectural setting in some way when we got to the center of town to the square which i recall had a a church an opera house and a government building if i'm remembering correctly yeah, beautiful yeah. stone buildings i drove in and to my astonishment and horror i saw graffiti on this beautiful beautiful stone and as i got closer i realized it was in chalk it was not in paint so there was a yeah. There is a reverence for history, in spite of all this, this horrible stress, that yeah. that they wanted to interact with this architecture to make it their own to say we're here, and at the same yeah. time not to be destructive. Yeah, yeah, it is. It is it, you know, everything has changed now, and there is a new uh, like the same that happened in in Portugal, as Maria was saying. Uh, the downtown is revitalizing, like it's changing. And there's a lot of uh, movement towards downtown now, towards the, the neighborhoods around uh, downtown, which are becoming very popular and gentrified. And there's a lot of construction going on over there uh, with towers and new buildings and new restaurants. And it now is uh, the up and coming areas. Like I think that happened around the world. It's kind of a movement of going back to the center in order to find a job that you can walk from your house to your work and then to not to commute and because here in Guadalajara you have to commute everywhere but nowadays everyone is going back to downtown and everyone I think of course if you go right now to downtown everything is clean there's no graffiti in the in the stone buildings not anymore and I went last uh, last Thursday to a presentation of a of a movie and it was crowded and I couldn't believe, you know, we're in the pandemic area and a lot of people in the street, of course, wearing masks, but it was crowded. And a lot of people, at, it was eight o'clock and it was a lot of people moving. So it's somehow, it makes me, you know, feel good that everything is again going okay. But also in a way that the downtown areas are getting much better. Of course, we have a lot of problems of security and still vandalism and still there are, but are, you know, like, and, you know, corruption and things like that. But I think things are changing because the new generations wants to have a better life and better life means to walk, to find the job that is close to your house and you don't have to commute and to have a better way of meeting with people in the neighborhood. We developed a, a project uh, three years ago about a bar that is in the neighborhood that we wanted to do a bar that everyone in the neighborhood will feel the bar has been there for 30 years. So we developed strategies that, you know, allows people to put graffiti on it actually. Mm -hmm. And people will go there and make the, you know, their, their scratchy things and graffiti in the walls because we want them to feel that it's theirs. And it's very respectful, nobody does it, like just the artists. So, which is fine, you know, like there's something that is changing and is for the better of the town. I, I believe it's changing and we need to talk to more to the people to understand them. As you said, if they want to participate, they need to participate. In this bar, actually, we created walls that, you know, allows you to 
put graffiti on it. The, actually, the first, when we were doing the, 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 the bar, the facade, we cleaned the facade and we put it like perfect. And somebody came and did the graffiti and we were very upset. Like, ah, why this is happening? You know, my client, there were four girls, the, the clients were four girls and they were upset because they said, oh, they just, you know, they just ruined the facade. I'm like, I thought that, that that graffiti was part of the design of yours, like you did this. No, 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 they ruined it. And I said, just leave it there. So the graffiti has been sitting there for, for four years now. And I really like it, you know? So it's just a face. It's just a, an ugly face of graffiti in the bar, outside in the facade. So when maybe the, when the graffiti guys saw this graffiti, and they see that we didn't remove it, that we leave it. I feel they feel proud of having that graffiti in the bar. So and it's funny. Feel, so, sorry to interrupt you, Luis, but they also feel accepted, and they yeah. feel and they feel seen because yeah. um, just also to give you an example. For example, in the school where I where I was studying in my high school, all my friends were uh, graffiti artists. They they really uh -huh. were doing it for real. Uh, on the weekend, uh, watching over if they would be caught and going to sneaky places and so on. And some of them became, well, most of them didn't do too much with their lives, I have to be honest, but some of them became quite successful. Uh, they, they went to art school and, and one of them is actually still working in the city, in the city where I grew up, Almada, and he's, he's a local artist and he's very engaged with the municipality exactly to... Uh, boost the young talent and also because it is a part of the identity of, of this city that this kind of indie culture and using graffiti and so on as a form of political protest this is this is part of the identity so I think that this should definitely be also encouraged it, yeah. exactly so this is a graffiti this is a yeah. facade that we clean and then this is the graffiti that these guys did and we just leave it there so it's exactly. part of now of the uh, and, and, you know, like this bar actually, this is how it was. And this is what we uh, did in the bar and mm -hmm. how, you know, these walls are allowed, you know, allows you to bring everything you want to put there. Mm -hmm. So somehow it's, you know, like this also, they, you know, a graffiti guy came and did this. So everything over there, I, the, the only rule was that you can touch everything you want from, from this point up, you can do everything you want. But from this mm -hmm. point down, you cannot do anything because we need to have kind of a clean area space. So it is it, working, you know? Uh, mm -hmm. So everything is with, you know, all this area that we want to have like a very punk kind of atmosphere, mm -hmm. like you can do whatever you want, but somehow it's clean and organized and yes. it has to be easy to clean. It has to be easy to maintain. So things like that. No? So I'm, I'm sorry, I just want to show you really quickly that. Right. No, no, that. I think it's it's a God save the gin, exactly apropos. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah. pink, uh, oh, sorry. Punk, punk references. <laughs> yeah, so it's, it's kind of a, what it should be happening in, in a bar that is for the people and for the community and for the neighborhood. So we want to do it like, you know, dirty kind of feel because it wasn't like that. We recreated this atmosphere it was designed to be like this it's because uh, in reality what we want to do is atmospheres you no know? so we so this is part of what the what we're doing so as i said it was like this and then the result was this mm -hmm. well, wow. but anyway it was just like a, another Small example, <laughs> I can be talking for hours, so please will, stop me. <laughs> we will do another conversation at some point. But now I would like to uh, involve our students who have been very, very quiet, but I think that they, they were very inspired by what we have seen and what we, we have talked about so far. Uh, so I would like them to, to also to make some contributions and some questions. Uh, and don't be shy. I mean, this is a wonderful opportunity to, to learn. So please go ahead. I think they went to sleep now. <laughs> they're, not, they're not allowed to sleep. We had a long break. <laughs> Dear students, are you still here? Shall I call you by name?
Milton left. Okay, yeah, yeah. <laughs> they are, I, maybe I think you are, were sleepy. <laughs> maybe they are uh, stunned and they need a little time to process, but now, now they're coming back. Yeah, so. Questions, please feel free. I think Annalyn, oh, Laura is starting, yes. Um, no, actually, my question was already asked because um, I was also wondering about um, this kind of conflict. Um, on the one hand, like including the people and like making them comfortable because including memories of them, parts of their culture. And on the other hand, maybe the responsibility of us architects to challenge people, to widen their view, for example, this playground, to give them something new, to challenge, challenge them a bit. And my question just was, um, how do you deal with this? Do you find a balance or do you decide for one thing for each project? Yeah. Well, uh, you know, it's, it, is, it is very complicated because, you know, there are two different types of projects. Right, one that comes with a business model together. And some client comes and said, I need to increase my sales. I need, need to do this because we are going to invest this and that, and we need to do it short in a short time. We need to do this and that. So you need to work with them and you need to figure out what they really want and who are their users. And sometimes clients think they are the final user. Like most of the clients that they don't have experience, uh, let's say like a small projects like a restaurant or bars, uh, they always come to you or well, they come to the, to, the, to the studio and they ask us to develop a project based on their feelings or their gut, you know, or, or what they feel it should be done. And, as soon as we talk about business, what is, is this a business and how you have to create this business and you want to survive with the business, we need to focus on other aspects, not just on the design process. And this is important and, and maybe a lot of people is not okay with this, but for me, it is important that we always focus on the business of the people that is asking you to develop a business. One is business. And the other one could be something that is very artistic or poetic or a house. That's different. That's another type of client. Like the ones I did the house, they're very, you know, I really love those guys. And I really enjoy meeting them. When I met them, actually, when I met them, it was an amazing opportunity for me to, to connect with clients that I wasn't connecting like that much until I met them, you know? Uh, so th this was a different type of project. It's a project that you get connected with the human sense of their sensibilities, their, their children, their, their life as a couple, as friends. And they weren't my friends. And now we became friends. You know? I stay in the house and they're very, very nice people. And they're my clients and they continue being my clients. So we work for them in different, you know, it's like different level of, energy let's let's just put it that way so when you work with them you understand a different aspect of architecture and you understand what it means for you and for the people architecture but if you develop a project that is as i said for a business you need to focus on the idea of business these projects i always talk to my clients for how long you want to have this project the project of avar in particular restaurants and bars the gastronomic experience it lives around five to seven years. And after that, you have to renew it. And nowadays it's even shorter time. Like if a restaurant survives for the first year, that's, a, that's successful for one year. But then if it survives for three, that means you erase the line that you can become a classic or you will disappear. And what happened with this restaurant I show you is been seven years. And it's very successful. And they have been telling me, you know, they, that what, they, what happened in that they need to renovate. So they always call me and said, we're gonna change the color. Is this color okay? So we did some, remo some renovations with color and with furniture, but we didn't change the architecture because it remains as it is because now it's iconic. So we work for that. 
But there are other restaurants, they tell me, we need to renovate in three years. So we need to focus on the business. What do you want to have in this project? And for the girls in the restaurant, for the bar that I was showing you before, this bar, they said, we want to keep this as the bar of the neighborhood. So we wanted to keep it for as much as we can, like for 30 or 40 years. So that's why we allow people to be involved in the project, like to you know, put the graffitis, to be there and to experience the project as their own. And it's been changing. And for me, it doesn't mean that I need to remind, I need to, to have my idea develop and it should be like that forever. No, on the contrary, I understand that this is a business for them and they needed to have been changing within time. So the only rules that I apply are the rules that are for maintenance and for organization and for harmony of the space and for something that we allow them to operate correctly. So we develop a project that is very technical in the technical aspects of maintenance and production of you know, the beer or whatever is going on there. So as I said, every project has to do with what is the purpose of this project within the, 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 the time span? Like, what do you want for this project? And understanding you, the position of you as an architect, understanding where you at with your client allows you to be successful or to just, you know, be wrong with them. So I'd rather prefer to work understanding what the business is going to be within the time and develop within the strategies that will allow them to operate in the future, these type of spaces. I'm not sure if I'm answering to your question. Yeah, actually, yeah. <laughs> no, 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 that was, okay. that was super interesting. Um, one more question. Um, because you said it depends on the client and that you um, notice what he really needs and want. But did you also fail like with this intuition what they really need or did it always of work? No, no, no. Of course I have failed. I had actually, I was talking to one of the construction guys uh, a week ago and we were talking about this project that we developed that was very difficult to read a client. And sometimes it's, you know, it's a matter of uh, personalities and we didn't get along very well. And I was feeling really bad and I was always trying to be, you know, like how persuasive and how can I help you? How can I help you? But if the client didn't want to talk about, you know, so I said, well, you know, just go ahead. And I know the project ends up really well. I know the project is almost 90% of what I designed. And, but I think the client had other problems that weren't to do, like it, was, it wasn't me, it was a lot of the context of what was going on and you know, budget and a lot of things that were going on within the construction projects that didn't get us to get very well in the, within the process. So for me, of course, that was something that I learned. And from that experience, I changed a lot of my strategies. I now sit a little bit more and try to be more communicative and try to connect a little bit better, but not always you can, you know, you, I mean, it's like you were, you're telling them like, I can help you, but they didn't want to get help. So it's like, well, why should I, I mean, if, if I'm putting all my effort and you don't want to give your effort back, it's not working. So for me, it's more like, how can I, you know, be with you, understand you be in the same vibe but if it's not working it doesn't work and of course we have failed projects but we have uh fortunately we have more successful projects than failed projects which is for me the most important thing that's why i have you know continuous clients or some clients that call me once and they keep calling me which is great you know but, but everywhere I, I i think everyone do it uh, it's good to accept it <laughs> <laughs> And it's always a, an ever-evolving uh, learning process, and and sometimes yes. we can learn from these difficult uh, difficult clients also, yes. where we can where we are also being difficult, or uh, yeah. it's it's always an evolving experience. Thanks, uh, yes. Laura. Really, really nice questions. I think Andalena and Rafael also would like to make a question. Like today, I don't have any questions, actually. I just wanted to add that it was really inspirational. So I made a lot of notes for like the design <laughs> I do this semester. 
And I'm glad that this is um, recorded so I can look again at these great before and after pictures. They were very great. Thank you. Thank you, Angelina. And Rafael? Uh, yes, I, I don't have uh, a lot to add. I just wanted to know if you define these principles, if you know, like your that semantic, the formal, did you define them before you start to actually work or is it more like a process that you like kind of over the time you develop these different uh, principles or yeah. Yeah, uh, actually it's, it's within the time, you know, it's a process. Uh, as soon as I just started to be more, uh, let's say not academic, but let's say more focused on a reflection of the, on the work I was doing, I started finding a lot of patterns. Let's say that within my practice, I've been practicing for more than 20 years, you know, uh, architecture. Uh, but the most relevant projects started after maybe 10, 10 years ago uh, or, or 10 to 12 years ago. I started to do a little bit more serious practice because before I was you know, doing my master's and then working as a professor and not focusing 100% uh, on the studio. But like 12 years ago, I started focusing more on, on the work and start thinking like, how can I introduce the narrative? How can I introduce like different concepts that weren't in the concepts of the four constructs? They weren't, they weren't just, you know, different concepts all over. But then when I review my practice, every time I, I was going to give a lecture or I was going to, you know, do something more serious on trying to create an essay of uh, something that I really enjoy and like, I put together like some repetition of concepts that I was doing constantly that I didn't have like an order. So I said, well, when I'm doing this narrative, what, is, what does it mean the narrative? And what does it mean to create a concept that will connect with the society that I'm designing for? What does it mean to uh, develop something that is formal? And what happened with movement? And what is about this and that? So I, I'm, I'm putting all these concepts in a list and then I realized there is a connection with some of them. And, you know, in those, in those uh, uh, observations is when I, I made the, a, a paper for the AMFA because I was relating, connecting. Huh, if this means this, then is this. In this, this is, so I, I made the connection. And then I started reading like, okay, this author is saying this about memory. And this author is this, saying this about light and vision. So this connects with this and they start making connection, connection, connection. And then I presented the paper and then I presented it to Michael Arviv and Michael Arviv is very tough. And then he said, no way. <laughs> you need to focus on this and this and this is wrong and this is right. And so he was very kind of uh, giving me a lot of feedback and we started conversations and that's what it led me to work with him on the, on the book. Because, you know, as, as I started with that particular uh, concepts and ideas, and I connect with a neuroscientist that he said, I have a book and you can connect with, with your work, whatever you're saying, because it's very similar to what I'm saying. So it was like a voila or a, an eureka moment for me. Like I said, wow, yeah, right. And then he said, you're wrong if you think there are just four constructs. And I'm like, yeah. I'm wrong because there are no four constructs. And then he said, well, maybe there are 20 or 50, mm -hmm. or maybe there are just 10, or maybe there are four, but you need to figure it out all of these that you're saying, because there are more. And as soon as I start writing more, then I come back again to something that is similar to the one that I said, I said before. So I'm like, no, this is wrong. So yes, I, I, when I was writing this, uh, when I was doing this presentation, I came up with two or three more. But I wouldn't put it here because it would take me some time to digest those. But you know, like this is a process of uh, learning. And this is not, that's why I said, these are just four constructs for now, but we don't know what's coming or if there will change within time. But for now it works in my mind. It's a map for me. It helps me a lot to understand what I'm doing and how can I put concepts to those ideas or names to those concepts, sorry. So somehow it's like, okay, I got it. And some, sometimes comes another idea. I'm like, 
uh, this goes related to this concept or this construct. Oh, no, 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 this should be separated. So yeah, it's a process. This is, I'm, I'm in, my, in my first steps as well. <laughs> so Luis, we, we really look forward to maybe in, uh, in 10 years or so, maybe see your own book with these <laughs> reflections. I think it would be great and we would all love to learn a little bit from, what you're, from your learning process also. Thank you. Thank you. Really great. <laughs> I just need some time, a little bit more time to, <laughs> to do it. Yeah. But yes, I love it. You will, you will take time your is, time. Yes. Yeah, I, I think course. that's all. Time all is, great, is mine. Yeah. Yes. Time all, is all, mine. All, all great things uh, take, take time to brew and to cook and, and to the, digest and process. And speaking of time, I mean, this is a lot of fun yeah. and we have been learning a lot, but uh, we started already a few hours ago because we always have discussion and then the conversations. So we will have to finish for now. Uh, but thank you so much, Louise. This is a wonderful uh, contribution, also very stimulating. And I, I could continue this conversation for a long time. So we, we will have a second run maybe at some point. Definitely. I it would be a pleasure to talk to, to you guys again. And, you know, Maria has my email. If you have questions, please feel free to write an email or any questions or, you know, comments you wouldn't have. I'd be glad to, to answer. And thank you, Maria, again, for this wonderful opportunity to share this with, with you guys. Thank you, Luis, so much for your contribution and, and for all the thoughts. So bye-bye for now and see you next time. Bye. Bye-bye. See you soon. Bye-bye.